Mike asked me to talk about uh, dynamic neuromuscular stabilization, or DNS. And it's, this is just an intro. There's a lot uh, to it. So I'm sorry if your brains hurt after I tried to pack a lot of information into a little amount of time, plus a little bit of lab. So, um, <clears throat> so special thanks to Prague School, which DNS comes out of, and then Claire Frank, who teaches a lot in the US. So she, and if you've taken her movement links class, there's a little bit of introduction to DNS in that as well. Uh, so the founder is, um, his name is Professor Pavel Kolosh, and uh, he's, right now he's the head of the Clinic of Rehabilitation, I know that's how you pronounce it, <laughs> I didn't, it's not a typo, um, he's the head of the uh, Prague School of Rehab in the Czech Republic, and he kind of, DNS was, um, his strategy of treatment after uh, studying under his mentors, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, like Professor Voita and Carl Levitt and uh, Professor Yonda as well. So there's his picture. Okay, so what is DNS? And it's, um, it's okay, so basically it's a strategy, a rehab strategy, and it's based on principles of de developmental kinesiology and um, also the principles of the maturing loco postural locomotor pattern system in specifically um, like from zero to 13 months of life. And um, so it defines posture, breathing, joint centration, and neurodevelopment. Um, and kind of functional movement from a neurodevelopmental perspective. And then, so when we're looking at, when you're looking at movement patterns, you're basically comparing that to uh, like how a baby would move because they, a healthy baby would be considered to have like pure movement. So it's not um, messed up by our, you know, bad habits and things like that. Yeah. And so, um, oh, sorry. Did it go? Click. Click. Oh, okay. So, okay. So we, um, when you're doing your assessment and training, um, it's really important to train in both um, basic and stabilizing function, so basically concentric and eccentric, as well as open and closed chain. Um, and the positions are derived from the developmental kinesiology postures. And then um, some key phrases are the integrated spinal stabilizing system and IAP, which um, I'm sure you guys have heard or seen me use in my charts, so that's the intra-abdominal pressure. Um, and it's really... Uh, the DNS approach is that it's um, having good stabilization is key to having efficient movement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the goal is basically, like anything, to improve and normalize quality of postural stabilization patterns, uh, breathing patterns, and neurolocomotor patterns um, to correct movement dysfunction, um, and then also to reintegrate back into the CNS. So I like DNS because it kind of bridges the gap between ortho and neuro. So there's that uh, neuro re-education component um, so that you're just kind of reprogramming back to motor patterns that you should have been developed, that you should have developed as a baby. Um, so for example, um, when you're looking at for when we look at the babies, basically from birth till like 13 months, the goal is for them to be able to start walking, so bipedal locomotion. And but the first part of that would be to have sagittal stabilization of the chest and pelvis, so that you are able, they are able to move their arms and legs and like roll or get into quadruped. So when you're looking translated into adults. Um, if you're noticing they're having a lot of extra movement, then you have you would take it back and check, like, okay, how are they even stabilizing in the first place? So just to review, 
uh, the three levels of motor control. So there's spinal and brain stem level. So uh, for, for DNS, that's like zero to six weeks. So it's the primitive reflexes. Uh, there's really no like balance or, and they don't really have stability. So babies just kind of move around however without any purposeful movement. And then the subcortical level, um, you start to integrate the primitive reflexes into higher levels of motor control. And then your locomotor patterns um, start to mature and then you become more stable and then you can kind of muscles start co-contracting uh, or moving together, working together to eventually get the baby to start walking. So, and then the third one is higher level, so like kicking a ball or running or sports, uh, where you're, it's um, multi-sensory and you're learning, and so it's cortical. Um, so for DNS purposes, it's mainly the first two that we, uh, that is kind of um, used for assessment and treatment. Okay, so then, Let's look at the ISS. So I'm sure everyone's familiar with kind of the core and um, intra-abdominal pressure, but just to review, so it's basically made up of the multifidi, um, your deep neck flexors, diaphragm, abdominal wall, and then pelvic floor. And so um, uh, Dr. Carl Levitt, was, his research was saying that um, postural function is interdependent with respiratory function. So if someone's not breathing well, uh, as you can see in the second with the red, then see the diaphragm and the pelvis aren't parallel. So they need to be parallel to give you that nice uh, bracing and the, the pressure and stability. When you, uh, even if you're, so if your aligned posture is um, not correct, then energy escapes and then you can get things like the disc, you know, back pain, neck pain, things like that. Um, the ISS, this is a feed forward mechanism. So it turns on automatically before you go to move or move your arms or legs or things like that. Um, so if there's insuffic insufficient stabilizers, then that's the frequent cause of um, bad motor patterns or injury. So uh, we're just going to look at principles to treat adults. There's a whole set for babies. So if you're interested in the babies, Jack, <laughs> we could talk about babies. Um, but basically it's a set of functional tests. So there's 10 functional tests and um, they assess the quality of the stability, functional stability. And you're trying to find like the weak link that's causing the movement dysfunction. Mm -hmm. If you look, so the first picture here is basically like, quote unquote, like the dead bug. So this is something we use a lot. Uh, but actually it kind of correlates to um, three month supine in babies. So we'll look at that in a second. Okay, so the DNS assessment is based on comparing patient's movement um, to the stabilization pattern of a healthy baby. And then the treatment is basically neuroria and having patient perform these uh, developmental locomotor patterns um, to reestablish better joint centration and better stability. And again, muscles have to be trained in both stabilizing and dynamic function. So for example, um, like say someone has a weak glute medius, so the action, what is the action of the glute medius? Yeah, okay, hip abduction and depending on fibers, internal, external rotation. Okay, so you could have them do clamshells, that's fine. So you're training it to externally rotate, um, but you also have to, um, so you're training the femur on a fixed pelvis to open. But you also need to train, like if the femur is fixed, pelvic rotation over so that the glute medius will eccentrically lengthen too for like when you're doing things like gait because it's holding you and keeping you from, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and things like functionally, like for rolling, like if they're rolling in bed, you need to be able to have uh, 
the fiber is kind of open so they can move the pelvis over a fixed femur to like even get out of bed. Oh, joint centration. So it's like the optimal position of a joint. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I think like um, I know like PIR comes up a lot, but I, I kind of like the term joint centration better because it depends on the movement. So you're trying to optimize the position based on what movement you're going to do versus PIR could always kind of change depend. I mean, there's, it's not as functional. It's not. Okay, so we'll do. Oh, okay. So these are good posters. These are from the Prague School. So basically, it shows um, what the adult patient would be in, if corresponding to the baby in terms of their little milestones. So. We have like dead bug would kind of correspond to the three month supine. And then there's things like bear at the 12, 11, 12 month, things like that. So <laughs> when you're looking at your patients and you put them in these positions, you want to think of, look at, you know, babies <laughs> and see how nicely they are. And then look at your patients and try to kind of get them to <laughs> be like the babies. Yeah, well, mine's okay. <laughs> All right, so these are the 10 tests, uh, the functional tests. So each test requires proper ability to um, perform intra-abdominal pressure and stability. Each test has a different postural challenge, but it's not... Um, if you're going to do your evaluation, you don't have to do all the tests. You can just kind of pick some. Um, and then always we're comparing it to a healthy baby, their form. So today I thought we would do the intra-abdominal pressure test, which corresponds to three months subine, and then the arm lifting test because we've seen it a lot with like MSI and we can kind of see the difference. There we go, okay. I think, um, in my PowerPoint, they like they were appearing. So okay, so here, <laughs> here we can look at. So we'll look at this is um, him around three months. So um, at three months, the baby should have good sag sagittal stabilization, meaning that um, he can keep his trunk in midline without like wiggling all over the place. Uh, he has a little gown on, but. Tr uh, trunk should be kind of barrel chested and abdominal wall cavity should be activated. Pelvis and diaphragm are neutral now, so they're parallel to each other. And then his base of support for the three month old would be back of the head, uh, behind the scapula, and then pelvis or LS junction. So it's kind of a diamond shaped support. Okay. And then, so when babies hold their legs against the surface, it looks really easy. They shouldn't be like, you shouldn't, you don't see them holding their breath or engaging their neck or um, using a lot of hip flexors. Uh, their spine is nice and long, so and head is not um, overly extended or flexed. So then when we look at the adult, oops, sorry. Um, so same thing, so the test position is gonna be patient is supine and triple flexion with mild hip uh, abduction and external rotation. And then legs are supported uh, either on the chair or the therapist's legs. And then important, so again, for DNS looking back at the ISSS and intra-abdominal pressure, so we need the rib cage to be in a neutral position. So if they're starting um, with rib cage in inspiratory position and extended, then they're going to fail the test automatically. So you have to try to get, give them their best chance to pass. So you have them inhale, exhale, move their ribs into neutral, and then you'll gradually take the support away from their legs. And so you'll be looking for um, abdominal muscle activation, seeing if they can breathe or if they have to hold their breath to maintain that position, um, that their pelvis and their diaphragm remain parallel, and then looking for compensation at the shoulder girdle or the head. 
So I'm going to switch to, let me see. Sorry, Ken, I think you need to. <laughs> um, these are my DNS slides, and they have better pictures. So you can see. Oh, sorry. Yeah. OK. So the happy faces are people doing it well. <laughs> and then we'll look at the not good activation. So I feel like I see this one a lot with the rib cage like really up and the stomach pulled in. Um, you can also see like the pseudo hernia pop up. <clears throat> um, extension at the TL junction, uh, over use of the hip flexors. So those are just some compensatory things that could happen. Um, oh, and then when they're looking for, like, uh, when they talk about barrel, like a nice abdominal wall, we look for, like, hills and valleys. So, like, the one with the sad face, the rectus is really active, and then it's hollowed, like, we're um, down by the groin area, so, so it's like he's basically they're trying. It's like an overactive rectus abdominis, so you're using some of it, some of your abdominal wall, but not not the obliques. Like expansion is not there. Um, and then for your athletes, if they're really if they're able to maintain this position, then you can um, progress them to the floating leg. So same thing, except then they extend their hips out, but keeping the shins, trying to keep them parallel to the ground. So this is a uh, higher level. So it's a good way to challenge your athletes. OK, and then the next test I'll have you guys practice is arm lift test. So, yeah, yeah, you could, you know, practice on each other. Yeah. Um, so, as you see, there's the picture of the baby. Um, and so, you can do this test either uh, supine or standing. Um, and basically, you just have the patient, again, you're, if you're in supine, patients in hook lying, and you have them elevate their arms to 120 degrees of shoulder flexion. And again, you're looking for good starting rib position um, and seeing if they're moving, if they're able to maintain a nice uh, stable spine. So not, no extension from either lumbar or thoracic spine. Um, and then also seeing if they can maintain ribs in neutral. I think that's it. Yeah. So those are the two. Tests and if you oh my I'll show you on um, Katrina yeah she's my volunteer so we'll go to the table oh sure okay okay so I'll just go over the reason I chose a three month prone is oh sorry the intra abdominal <laughs> pressure test is because I feel like there's a lot of different ways to do dead bug, but so the DNS, this is a DNS approach to do it. Okay. So usually I just put my leg on the table so that they're resting here. And then you can just observe uh, passively how she's breathing. Okay. And then I just ask, okay, take a nice deep breath in. And then I'll take her rib cage down into neutral. And if they can't, hold it here and still breathe, then it's um, it just kind of tells me something about their coordination and how they like to breathe. Okay, so you're going to keep your rib cage here. And then, sorry, do you mind if I? Oh. Okay. So we're just looking, also looking at any hills and valleys, things like that. As I take my hands away, you're going to keep your legs So I would look at uh, neck, <laughs> if she can keep her shoulders relaxed. Also, too, people tend, their feet start to come in as a stability thing. So we try to open, keep them in a little bit of hip external rotation. And for her, I would just have her, like for a minute, just have her hold it. Yes. 
Yeah, so, um, sorry, yeah, <laughs> let me read the question. So, yes, ISSS activation um, is a feed forward mechanism, but we are training in a feedback to uh, establish, reestablish ideal pattern so that it can, when she does start to uh, integrate it, it'll become, uh, but she's feed forwarding in the correct movement pattern. <laughs> Good, doing okay? Okay, and relax. Okay, so then for arm elevation test, you'll be in hook lying, and I'll just have you raise your arms up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then down. And again, good, and down. So she does, so I'm looking for, a lot of times I'll see either arching of the rib, yeah, thank you. And then if I hold them, then their arms are like way up here. Uh, or um, they just can't relax and they, you know, you, kind of the same things that you look for in normal arm elevation test but with the focus also, too, on this, the trunk stabilization. So what you were stopping with your hands, you were stopping her ribs coming up? Yes, yeah. So I'm stopping with my hands. I kind of want to feel if her ribs go up into, like, inspiration position versus being able to keep them more in a neutral position. So when you're breathing, um, that she doesn't, she can still breathe correctly without hyperextending from the spine. Thank you. Okay, so go ahead and break up. It. Oh, sorry, any questions so far? I thought, nope, okay. Because this position, I feel like for most of our patients, is hard. Yeah. It's really hard you know, for it to do correctly. And so, especially not letting the legs. Arms over here. So this is just to see how it works together with the. Yeah, see yeah. how he moves. So we hold uh, I just kind of like yeah. gently like put my hand like here. So have him like in, um, yeah, like lower ribcage. Breathe in, Brian. Oh, don't put too much pressure. Yeah, just breathe in and then exhale. So you just want to keep him kind of like. Yeah. A little bit of rice is okay, yeah. So kind of looking for him, I would look, can come down? And up. Good, and down. So he can, he can maintain yeah, that, so he has good active, like, oblique. Peak. Flat your stomach is when you're here, and you, how much you can breathe in here when your legs are closer. So you have to be able to do that. Yeah. That's something you would then, I guess, progress to? Yeah, you can. Yeah. No, you can't. So this is just to kind of show you, like, okay, he's moving funny, and then from there you can be like, oh, boy, yeah, what is it? And then you, then you work on whatever you need to work on. Yeah. So you can do, like, your manual or however you want to. Loosen it up. Yeah, it's just assessment. So, like, if it's like a muscle tightness, then you could do, and then a little bit of hip abduction and external rotation. And then the goal is to keep your ribs down. Or so have him ribs neutral. So yeah, so have him breathe in first. And then you go. Ah, that's pretty good. But look at his head movement too. Yeah, oh, I don't know. A uh, little bit. Yeah, a little bit of extra rotation. There we go. There we go. Um, oh, what are like these hills and valleys that we're talking about? So, so when you're in the um, three-month supine test, the intra-abdominal pressure test, if you see like a rise, like mostly rectus, that would be like a hill. And then if you see hollowing here, those are your valleys. And the reason we I um, have the p patient stay a little bit longer is because sometimes they initially, it looks really good. And then as the muscles fatigue, then you see um, which muscles like to take over and which ones are a little bit weaker. 
Um, another question is, okay, so I see these things going on, what do I do? So um, it's kind of these tests are so you can observe the movement and then you can figure out, okay, is it like a, a muscle length problem? Is it an instability problem? And then, you know, then you can go to your toolbox and do whatever you would like to do to make it better. Um, so, you know, you could stretch stiff and tight muscles or maybe you need to work on strengthening to give them a little bit more stability. Um, so that you can kind of be creative about, or you can actually give the test as um, an exercise. And so some questions came up about treatment. So um, a lot of uh, the main kind of points are, um, you really need patient participation. So these aren't passive things, they're really thinking about it to get that CNS integration as well too. So you need them to be, it's a constant dialogue, tell me what you feel, you know, can you feel this even? And so if they can't, then sometimes my treatment is session, like the 30 minutes is spent on like getting them to be able to breathe or figure out what muscles to use and when. And then um, th the movement is very slow. And so, and that gives them a chance to really get more body awareness and figure out what's going on. And also the reps are low because they're doing so much thinking um, the mind fatigues as well as the muscles. So usually if they can do five good ones, that's all they're going to do. And I don't give them these exercises for home unless they're able to correctly demonstrate that to me in the clinic. Otherwise, they're just going to reinforce bad movement patterns, and we don't want that. Okay. And then kind of explaining, like, functionally why are we doing these things. Now, yes. You find the carry pretty good. Um, okay, so the question is, do I find if carryover is good? Uh, yes and no. I think sometimes it takes a little couple sessions to get the buy-in, first of all, and also to remind them and point out every different thing that they're doing that they need to, um, like, move correctly. So for, like, my shoulder patients, if they're, like, if we work on breathing and then... Um, if they can next time come to me and say, okay, at least I was focusing on my breathing, then the next time I can add on, like, okay, so every time you reach now, like, for your dishes, I want you to turn on your muscles. So I think it comes in steps. Um, because I think sometimes patients come and they just want reps of exercises to do. So kind of switching it and, and dialing down is a new concept for them. Okay, and then when you're doing your motions, you know, looking for stabilization of the trunk, um, making sure their joints are well centrated so they're moving correctly in the socket when they do their movements. Um, good uprighting. So a good example is uh, like when you do quadruped and they're rocking. And so from a DNS perspective, we're looking at the whole spine as they rock forwards and backwards, also like shoulder blade position. So even if you're looking at the hips and are they getting the hip hinge, you have to look at what their neck and their, um, like their thoracic spine is doing too. Um, and then looking at their breathing pattern, making sure they're breathing or able to breathe. Um, and then you have to match the resistance to their quality of movement. So a lot of times I start like way back, dial it back a lot for them. And then with the athletes, it's a lot of fun because you can do higher level things, put them, make them more unstable. Use the th you can use the TheraBand um, for a lot of the positions too. Okay. And then just kind of a summary. Um, so basically for DNS, it's assessment and treatment based on positions of developmental kinesiology. And... Um, you can't just train when we're talking about the ISS S and the IAP, <laughs> not just training one muscle. Uh, they have to be able to coordinate with each other. So this is why it takes a long time. It's kind of difficult because we're taking something in a baby that they don't think about and now trying to retrain it in an adult where you have to think about what's going on. So that's sometimes challenging. 
Um, and then just remember, breathing is interdependent with, um, with stability. Oop. So if you want further, here's some articles that I found helpful. I have a lot of articles, so I just picked some. But you can look at on your slides. Um, and I hope this is clear as mud <laughs> for you guys. It's just an intro. There's a lot more to it. Um, and if you're interested in the DNS course, I think they're having one in February. Yeah, in February. Or Movement Links is actually a good introduction, too. Yeah. Any questions? Oh, sorry. Yes, 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 yes. So in the clinic, I usually start with three months supine and three months prone. Uh huh. And then you can move on to like higher level things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But unless they get that, you don't move to higher level. Correct. It's not in Yes. Yeah. And they build on each other. Yes. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Tricks or tips on cues. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. So with the like the intra abdominal pressure test, a lot of times I like to prop their legs either on the ball or the chair, so my hands are free, so I can place them and say, okay, I need you to breathe like down into your lower abdominals where my st where my hands are. Well, first I say, can you feel this? And then I want you to push my fingers away and try to maintain that shape for as long as you can as you let your air out. Because it is a kind of, it's a different concept, yeah. Okay, because as they ex as you exhale, you can't just let your muscles go. It has to be kind of be an active exhalation, yeah. So to be able to keep the tension as you exhale. Mm -hmm. Or if I keep their rib cage down, I put my hand there, have them breathe a little bit, and then I say, okay, you take over. You keep your rib cage in this position and, and just try breathing. And then if they can do that, then I'll move on to the next thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of, it, 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 it's hard. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, yeah, they can cue themselves. Um, you can put their hands there. Actually, I found that if you wrap their band around their stomach, then they can feel it. And you just want them to expand the TheraBand all the way around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, p patients seem to get that a little bit more. Yeah. yeah, I've seen some some therapists. I think they cut like tennis ball halves. They like made their own, and they put it so that the round part is like in different spots. So you're expanding like the obliques a lot, and they wrap it around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'm not that extreme. Yeah, that's a lot of feedback. Yeah, you're basically like flooding their system. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah.